אז יש לנו שני אורחים מאנגליה, מקיימברידג', מהמחלקה לזואולוגיה, פרופסור ביל סאטרלנד, שעשה קריירה מרשימה בשמירת טבע בנופי אנגליה, וזה המקום להזכיר למי שלא מכיר, שלהבדיל מפה, לאנגליה נשאר מעט מאוד טבע. וערכי הטבע שיש להם הם בעיקר בסמיכות צפופה עם שטחי החקלאות. 70% מהשטח של אנגליה הוא חקלאי, 0.7 מהשטח זה שמורות טבע. אצלנו היחס הוא כמעט הפוך. כמעט. או בדרך. 20% שמורות טבע, אפשר להתווכח עליהם, ולא מעט שטח חקלאי. תגיד את זה בקול רע. ברור, לא, אבל פה זה ב... חוג המשפחה. ביל קיבל לפני מספר שנים את הקתדרה למחקר בשמירת טבע על שם מרים רוטשילד, כך שיש לו קשר מסוים ליד הנדיב, ופיתח מהדבר הזה מערכת שלמה מעשית ומחקרית שחלקה יוצג כאן. הוא עוסק בעצם בבסיס המדעי של קבלת החלטות בשמירת טבע שצמודה לחקלאות וזה מה שמעניין אותנו, יש כאן שניים מהתוצרים של העבודה שלהם. מעבר לכל זה הוא גם נשיא האגודה האקולוגית הבריטית. מי שמאיתנו מכיר הישגים מדעיים, המאמרים שלו זכו ל-24 אלף ציטוטים, זה מספר מכובד בחוגים המקצועיים, אבל עיקר ההשפעה היא השפעה של האינטרפייס בין המדע לקבלת ההחלטות. Uh, ועל זה הוא ירחיב את הדיבור היום. So, פרופסור סטלנד, please, the floor is yours. I'd say thank you, Avi, for that kind introduction, but he may have been, he may have destroyed me, I don't know, but I, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here again. Why did Kennedy invade Cuba? So he wanted to know whether or not that was likely to be successful. So he asked his chiefs of staff whether or not this was likely to be successful. And there's a chief of staff. And they said, to quote, timely execution of this plan has a fair chance of success, which it turns out meant about 25%. Kennedy said, well, if it has a fair chance of success, and that's probably, you know, more than likely to be right, then I'll do it. And said, go ahead. Uh, and the Bay of Pigs invasion took place, and as you know, it was a disaster. Um, and the head of the Chiefs of Staff all lost their jobs. Why did America invade Iraq? If you look at this, the, you can look at the Department of Defense and the CIA, And I don't know, there's certainly a lot of fuss about this in Britain. There was a big fuss over aluminium tubes, if you remember, it's going back a long time, and whether or not they were being used for uh, missiles. And CIA said, well, that's really compelling evidence. The Department of Defense knew about this stuff and said, well, actually, you can't use those tubes. That doesn't make any sense. The other compelling argument was that Iraq was Iranian, importing uranium from Niger, and the Department of Defense said, well, they got uranium. Well, that's pretty convincing. The CIA said, well, we investigated this. It doesn't actually make sense. If you investigate the story, it's not plausible. That doesn't seem to have happened. So they both had compelling evidence that Iraq had nuclear weapons. In each case, the compelling evidence was in the area they didn't know about, and in the area they did know about, they knew it was wrong, but overall, they were kind of convinced. Imagine going back to 2011, and you're discarding whether or not, in Abbottsabad, whether or not that figure there seems to be Osama bin Laden. What they did is they brought together a team of experts and then said, Do you think this is the case? Do you think that this is Osama bin Laden? 
And the CI person who's responsible said, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I, I'd say 95%. Director of Intelligence said 60%. Most of the people consulted said about 80%. They had some who they wanted to be sort of skeptical. We said 30 to 40. Then Obama said, well, this discussion's just sort of kind of confusing me. Uh, and that there wasn't actually generating more, that the, the that this wasn't actually providing more information, and he concluded a 50-50 chance. If you just look at the average of the people who gave an opinion, it came out at 69%. So you can say, there he is, there he is thinking about this. Here are sort of the ranges of opinions. President Obama said he thought it was 50%. He said, this is 50-50. Look, guys, this is a flip of the coin. I can't base this decision on the notion that we have greater certainty than that. But if you look at the evidence, almost certainly with sort of the probabilities, and you can imagine if you brought those people together to share their experience in the way we learned with the last decision, whereby you can find out what other people's weaknesses are, uh, we'd almost certainly change that too. It seems as I'm picking on the Americans here. I should say we're, we're investigating why we invaded, we're part of that invasion of Iraq. Uh, the Americans reported in 2004. I'm delighted to say that later on this year we're going to have a timetable as to when our report is going to be produced. <laughs> but it is, it's going to be good. They've written a million words so far. So it's a brilliant success, I think. But anyway, so um, sometime we'll have our report. It's a bit of a standing joke in Britain. So if you look at environmental decisions, you'll see there's a whole host of environmental decisions that also don't make sense. So, the President Bush, it seemed to be my anti-American theme again, in 2006 had a push for uh, producing biofuels. The European Union followed soon afterwards, and there's a big push for biofuels, partly for American reasons, for, sorry, partly for environmental reasons. And we now know from greenhouse gas, from food production, from land use, that this is not a sensible thing to do. But we did it at the time, and we weren't really prepared at the time to think to, uh, to have the science in place so we could respond. Uh, we, uh, the ash, Fraxina excelsis, is an extremely important tree in Britain. It's one of our commonest trees. We have whole woods that are just made of this tree. We decided it was a good idea to allow people to collect seeds in Britain, take them to continental Europe, where there's a disease called ash dieback spreading, mature the trees there because it's cheaper, and then import them into Britain and grow them. And we did that, and lo and behold, we now have ash dieback in Britain. It also seems it might have spread here naturally as well, but that seems to be quite a large element of that. You know, it's kind of hard to imagine how we made that decision. Well, if you look in the United, in, in Australia, they introduced the cane toads to get rid of pests of cane um, crops. Not a success, but it's just eating its way through the natural fauna. So the problem we have is that we use experts in order to make decisions. And if you look at how they work on environmental areas, which I think are really important, we're routinely making really silly decisions. But you might say the environment isn't very important. If you look at the, the most important decisions that politicians have to make, the decisions as to whether or not to go to war, you see that they routinely misuse their experts and have confusing conclusions because they haven't used their, evidence, their experts properly. So this is something I've become interested in. We want to talk about how you can use experts to make decisions, what's wrong with the process, and how you can improve that process. Uh, I've done some of this work for Mark Bergman. Uh, Yohei will recognize this. Yohei, uh, there's a similar picture of Yohei dressed, also dressed like this. I don't know if you know this is how Yohei dressed when he was in Cambridge, but this is, if you come and visit, remember to bring your bow tie. This is what we all do. Uh, but this is Mark Bergman. Um, and one of the things that Mark Bergman has done and Philip Tetlock has done is that they look at the ability of experts to predict 
conditions. And it's kind of depressing. Experts are often not much better than chance. So if you look, there's some areas where they are good, where there's short-term responses and weather forecasting, bridge playing, that sort of thing, they're quite good. But if you look about economic predictions, environmental predictions, predictions over warfare, all of those sorts of things, geopolitical events, they're not very good at making predictions as to what will happen. They're only marginally better than chance, but they're very confident, and when it doesn't go their way, they've always got an explanation for why it didn't go their way, but they don't get it right. And that, to me, is very interesting. So this is a very nice experiment that Mark did. He had a series of papers of scientific papers that had been accepted for publication, so they were high quality science, but hadn't been published. And he asked these group of people, is this in your, we could do it with you, your group of ecologists, is this in your domain of expertise? And we'd take those papers that you would say you know something about. If you say you don't know anything about that, we'd get rid of it. And he'd say, have you heard of this paper? I think it's one of the papers, one of them had something to do with, so we got rid of that. So here's a series of papers in your area of expertise, but you don't know what the answers are. And the first thing he did was he then looked at all the participants and said, each one of you give a two minute description of your knowledge, your expertise, as why we should believe you. And then everyone was to vote, was to score on how good they thought they would be at predicting the answers to these these, these questions that we asked about these papers, and how good you think everyone else is. So you hear the description, and, and you say, I think that person's really good, I don't think that person would be really good. And this shows that the two are correlated. So if you think you're good, everyone else thinks you're good, I'm afraid if you don't think you're very good, everyone else also doesn't think you're very good. Um, there's some nice people at the top right who, they think they're okay, everyone else thinks they're okay, but they think they're terrific. Uh, but by and large, it sort of, it, it goes up together. And, and I like this result. Uh, it's good to be aged. It's good to have lots of experience. It's good to be male. It's a very, very nice piece of research. He then went and tested to see how good they were at making predictions by saying, here's the result, you know, here's the dispersal rate of this plant. How far would you expect this plant to disperse? And he asked those sorts of questions of these experts in areas where they said they were experts. And this gave the results. So the lower down it is, if, you're, if you have a score of naught, it meant you've got it absolutely perfect. So higher up is bad. And we'll ignore the crosses. Uh, that's a Delphi technique which we'll come back to, which shows that that's better. But the dots and the thick black line show that the better everyone thinks you are, the slightly worse you are. <laughs> There's no relationship with skill. It's um, no relationship with skill. It's marginally better to be female. Uh, no real relationship with expertise. If you take sort of really inexperienced people, I think all of these might have PhDs. If you took master students, they were actually less good. But above that certain level, there was very little difference. You know, the, you know recently emerged PhDs were as good as aged professors. Hard to believe. Um, and so this, sh and this is not, this is what the literature shows. It is extremely difficult to find any good correlates of the ability of people to make predictions. A lot of the people that are good at predicting aren't of the established sort. They're very often people that are broad ranging, can look at way up different bits of evidence, and the more experienced people tend to just look at their single bits of evidence, particularly those that they're involved in, but they've also got their own agenda, things that they care about, uh, and that affects it. So we've, uh, with Mark, we then looked at um, what the literature says about how you use experts. Uh, this came out last week, but uh, this is the major, some of the major conclusions we came to. Using groups. So the problem we have is we use experts in one of two ways. You use experts either by you ask a single expert, or you get a group of experts together in a room and say, we'd like you to make a consensus. 
All the evidence shows that they are really bad ways of using evidence. That is not how to do it. There are better ways, and what we're interested in doing is finding ways of improving the use of expertise. So groups are better than individuals. People have very narrow areas of expertise. I know a lot about oyster catchers, but I'm on government committees to decide how to restructure research councils because I'm an expert on oyster catchers. It's kind of, you know, we think, oh yes, because we're an expert here, we've got really broad expertise. All the research shows that the expertise drops off very rapidly. And all of the sort of measures that we'd like to use, age, number of publications, practical qualifications, all of the things we use to assess expertise bear no correlation with people's ability to get the right answer. Almost no correlations. If you want to get the right answer, if you have a diverse group of people, that's much better than if you have a narrow group of people. People that think in different ways are more, uh, with a discussion are more likely to get it right than very similar groups of people. People are less self-assured and assertive and can integrate information from various sources, make better judgments. You can improve uh, skills by weighting people. This is very much Philip Tetlock's approach. He tests people to see how good they are at making predictions, and then he weights them by their capacity to get that right. You can train people so that you can improve their abilities to make predictions. And if you get rapid feedback, so if you're a weather forecast, if I, if I was an Israeli weather forecast and I said it's going to be bright and sunny today, then I would have had a, I'll have a hard time tomorrow morning uh, by all these people complaining. So you get very short-term feedback, as you do with chess players or sports players or gamblers or intensive care physicians, you know, saying, has this person got this critical illness? Uh, if they miss diagnosis, they'll know in the new, next couple of days. They are much, they're quite good, they're, they're, they're much better at making judgments than those people that look at long-term predictions, environmental predictions, geopolitical predictions, economic predictions, where there's a long time frame. So, what do we do about this? Uh, this is my hero, Croesus. Uh, here's the King of Lydia. Uh, and he test he he did the right thing. He wanted to to find out what um, how he could predict the future. So he did a test. It's a sa I'm going to test Ran. Ran doesn't know this. He's going to provide the same test. So he sent emissaries to seven different oracles to test them. So he asked them what the king was doing. So Ran, I'd like you to predict. Tell me now, what do you think the president of Israel is doing now? A bit of nothing, okay? <laughs> That's sort of, well, what, what happened here was the oracle at Delphi said, I think the king is making lamb and tortoise stew in a copper kettle. And blow me down, he was. Now, if Ran, you know, Ran's a fairly weak test. You know, if, if the president of Israel is doing nothing, that's kind of a little bit impressive. But if, if Ran had said, I think he's making lamb and tortoise stew in a copper kettle, and that turned out to be right, I would follow, well, I follow Ran quite a lot anyway, but I would follow Ran as a god forevermore. That was his second, second guess, yeah. <laughs> so based on that, Croesus said, well, the oracle at Delphi is clearly the real expert. So he had an important prediction to make. He was thinking of attacking Persia and wanted to know if that was a good idea. So he went to the oracle at Delphi and said, should I attack Persia? And the oracle said, if you cross a river, a great empire will be destroyed. It's not quite the yes, no answer you want, but anyway, that's, that's what she said. Uh, so he crossed the river. It, it, to get to Persia, you have to cross a big river. So he crossed the river and attacked, uh, and he lost, and his own emperor was destroyed. So the oracle was right, but just as a certain, it's a bit like the Kennedy problem. There's a l translational problem. So based on this kind of weird methodology, on this weird um, belief, 
there's been a lot of interest in something called the Delphi Technique. And I'm so obsessed with the Delphi Technique, I took my family on holiday there last week, last summer, so I'm a bit obsessive. And the way the Delphi Technique works is you ask a group of people to make their predictions as to, um, as to a particular um, outcome, and they do it anonymously. And you collect those informations, and you say, this is what we would predict. So rather like we showed for the uh, Osama bin Laden, you'd say, what's the probabilities here? You could collect all the different probabilities, and you then have a discussion, and particularly about the variability. Why do some people think there's a high probability? Why do they think there's a low probability? And this can be done online, anonymously. That's traditionally how it's done. We tend to meet pe get people to meet together. We then have a discussion. What is the, the weaknesses? What are the strengths? Imagine having this discussion about the n nuclear weapons in Iraq. You would discuss the tubes. Well, that seems kind of weak. You would discuss the uranium story. That seems kind of weak. You discuss those two elements and put that together. And then when you reanalyze, when you make another line of judgment, you do it based on that collected information. And sometimes you do that a few times. So you make your judgments, have a discussion, try to understand why there are differences, pull all of that information together, look at all the evidence, and then have another round of voting and judgments, and then that be outcome. Might do that a few times. So it's not. People often think using experts is just, you know, instead of using information, you're using all the information. It's not instead of information, it's the fact that the evidence is never satisfactory. If you think of the, my political examples, there's evidence there, but you've got to interpret it. And it's using the expertise to interpret the evidence. So that's what the Delphi technique does. And this is just um, an example of us. Uh, Lynn and I run endless workshops of this sort. There's a group of us um, uh, doing a Delphi exercise. We're discussing cases, and then around it, we've all voted on this. We've all seen what the distribution of scores are. You don't know whose scores are which. It's entirely anonymous. We have a discussion. We listen to what everybody says. We see who we believe, who we don't, who, what, what the good arguments are, what the weak arguments are, and then we rescore that as our decision. And all the evidence shows that the Delphi technique beats other techniques hands down. It's the best way of getting to the right answer. And I can describe that, I can describe that later to you, but I'm not going to meet you again because I'm fleeing, so I won't, you'll have to believe me. So what I'd like to do now is talk about two applications of the Delphi technique. First one is horizon scanning. It's saying, what are the up-and-coming issues? So think again of biofuels and the fact we didn't see biofuels coming. What we're trying to do is look to see what are the future issues that might happen and then think more about those. So we run this exercise every year. We don't always get on the front cover, uh, but uh, I'd briefly like to talk about some of the outcomes from this year. So one of the issues we have, just as an example, which I thought would be relevant to you, is the idea of managing bees as vectors to control diseases. So the idea here is that the bees spread the microbial control agents, such as bacteria or fungi or viruses, around the crops by taking them to the flowers. So you have, you sort of imagine you have a little doormat at the entrance, which is, has got this fungi or whatever in it, and as the bees go out, they trample on that doormat, get fungi on their feet, then go and visit the plants and distribute those control agents around the crops. And uh, you can use honeybees or commercially managed bumblebees. And the evidence is, when used in the field and greenhouses, that this does seem to be a way of working that reduces the need to spray the crops. And that might be an interesting thing for us to think about in the future. It's been used in blueberries, uh, which I think you sometimes grow here, and a, a range of other crops. So it's, it's something, we're not saying this is a good idea, we're not saying it's going to take off, we're saying it's an, air, an issue on the horizon that many of us haven't really thought about yet, and we should start thinking about it, both as a good idea, 
But also, what are the other consequences of this? Are there any negative sides to this? If you then have those control agents and they visit wildflowers, is that good or bad? What might happen? Will it change the community, etc.? I thought I'd just run through some of the other issues we, um, we raised that have an environmental uh, and agricultural bent. China is hugely changing its attitude. It has been um, a reputation for being quite destructive in the environment. It's now changing, so it's much more benign. It's got what they call ecological civilization policies. It's their choice of term, not mine. Um, uh, and they're restoring huge areas, they're planting new trees, they're very much changing their attitudes. And very interesting to see how that goes and if that spreads around the world with their influence. Land ownerships are often a common issue and there's no common way of finding out who owns which bit of land, especially when there's civil disruption. Uh, and you can use the Bitcoin technology in order to overcome that problem by having a documented database that, that in the same way as Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is open, who owns what? You could use the same thing for land ownership. There's a concern in some areas with organic farming. If you convert from conventional to organic farming, you have to wait three years with low yields uh, in order to be called organic. But if you take natural grasslands, you can do it in the first year. And so there's concerns about loss of natural grasslands. Vertical urban farming, this is growing plants in urban areas, in tall buildings uh, with blue-green light, uh, very little microbial, very, very few pests, um, don't have to wash the crops right next to the market. Uh, this is taking off in places like America. Uh, will, that, will there be more of that in the future? Perennial grains, there's development now of perennial cereals. Uh, and the idea here is that it'll have higher yield and less environmental damage as there won't be the re plowing and reseeding every year. You'll just have a permanent crop and you'll collect the seeds uh, over long term. You can feed your waste to maggots and then take the flies and the maggots and convert that to protein-rich feed for livestock. There's a concern over increased use of fungicides. Glyphosate is now accepted as a carcinogen, and might that affect its use? Uh, and there's sort of a bit of a swing against gly uh, glyphosate. And obviously, that's a fantastically useful and reasonably but environmentally benign herbicide. What would happen if there's less use of that uh, on yields or on the alternatives that are used? Available soil phosphorus, not soil phosphorus in general, but available soil phosphorus is extremely difficult to measure. There are now really quick ways of doing that, which opens all sorts of opportunities. And finally, to get rid of vertebrate pests, there's increasing use of laser lights, laser lights to clear birds and things away from your crops. Uh, what might the consequences of that be on benign birds, um, uh, etc.? So this is a whole set of issues. We don't know which ones of these are going to be important. What we're doing here is saying it's worth thinking more about up and coming issues. What I'd now like to talk about is my obsession with evidence and the use of evidence. And I could give endless examples of this. This is my example from last week. I was in a meeting in Natural England, which is the, U the English conservation organization. And someone gave a talk about managing harriers, birds of prey, in crops. And they're talking about what they do in France. And what Montague's harriers grow in crops in France, and, uh, and that's a bit of a problem. So when the farmer harvests the crops, they then get mangled up and die. And so what they're doing is that the conservationists take them, put them in captivity, rear them, and then release them sometime later. And last year they did that for 55 Montague's Harriers, and that's a big conservation success story and was portrayed as such. This was, I was in the Natural England headquarters, and I said, does anyone here know of the Natural England project on Montague's Harriers in cereals, where the solution they had 
was that they, they took the cereals out, they took the Montague's Harrier out and put them in a bag. The farmer then took the top of the cereals off, so just collected the seed, leaving the stubble. And then they put the, the, Mon the Montague's Harrier's chicks back, and they were fine, they were still uh, protected by a tall layer of vegetation, and that was fine, and it cost almost nothing. And no one there had heard of this bit of work, the Natural England were involved. And, and I don't know how much it costs to rear 55 Montague's Harriers in aviaries from chicks. It must be 50,000, 100,000 euros, do that for 10 years, half a million, a million euros, serious amounts of money, which they could have saved if they had learnt from the work that is done in that building. But they hadn't learnt. And this is not, this is just this week's example. I could bore you silly with hundreds of other examples. We are continually not learning, not taking advantage of our expertise. Thanks. So, so this is what Lynn has done. She says you can take evidence and you can put it as studies or systematic reviews, papers, or you can pull the reviews together. Or what we're interested in doing is synopses, and we'll leave this, we'll leave these for you to look at over coffee and lunch, and decision support systems, which is the top layer. And these say we pull together the evidence of what works in conservation as to what's effective. So as a couple of examples, uh, Lynn's run this for um, agri-environment schemes in the European Union. And when you collate the evidence and you use the Delphi technique to say what works and what doesn't work, you find out that the agri-environment schemes that we're about to spend, we are spending billions of euros a year on, don't, aren't effective because we didn't look at the evidence beforehand. If we had looked at the evidence, we could have done other measures which would have been more effective. And the cost of that is trivial compared to the work. And that's a much better way of doing things. So you can take the evidence from this, and you can classify it as to how effective it is, how certain it is, and then say, using a Delphi technique, looking at the available evidence that we have produced and we have summarized, and we do this in this workbook called What Works in Conservation, which is available online. As I said, I'm leaving two copies uh, for you to look at. And this is just an example. You can say for arable farming, which are beneficial, which are likely to be beneficial, which are unknown, which there's no evidence. So just an example of how that might work. We're concerned about producing field margins for bees, and we know that that works. But if you look at the detail, you'll see that there's different ways in which you can do it. This says five different ways in which you can do it. And some of these are really effective, some of these are really ineffective. So rather than this situation, oh, that works, which is where we are now, we really want to collate the evidence as to which, which elements work. What's the best way of doing this? What's the ineffective ways of doing it? As talking, as going up to Scotland to give a talk, and I thought I'd look at what the Scottish policies were, and they were looking at ecological focus areas, ways of taking out agriculture, and they were providing advi advice as to what to do. And the details don't really matter. It's all about buffer strips and nitrogen fixing crops and that sort of thing. That's what this is about. And this is my first ever selfie on the train. Because all of this information is online, you can access it, and you can then say, what is the evidence that buffer strip works? We've got a farmland synopsis. We can say there are 19 studies uh, that show that it's beneficial. There are other studies that show the planting bu um, buffer strips work. You can say, what hap more evidence? What happens if they're around rivers? More evidence. Um, what's the effect on soils? We've got a soil synopsis. You can say what the evidence there. I don't expect you to read any of this. I just want to be impressed that there's all of this evidence here. What's the effect on bees? There's studies on what the effects of bees are, studies on what the effects of birds are. The point I'm making is that in 10 minutes, you can go from here's a policy to say, I've got all the evidence, 
available and accessible. And that's what we want to do. We want to shift the way conservation works so the evidence can be used at the time you want it. So, um, so I just want to end. Uh, I've been a bit pessimistic about things, but I think the world is partly changing. So um, uh, this is a demonstration saying what do you want, evidence based change, when do you want it, after peer review. You'll notice there's only one banner saying that, but that's kind of, that's an improvement. And President Obama has said he's very keen on greater use of evidence in policy making. And particularly these are my two daughters, this was taken some time ago. Uh, this is Anna, age 10, school report for science. It says Anna is progressing well, but must take a more evidence-based approach. <laughs> it's kind of a bit of insult as me of a father, but anyway. So I'm not doing anything very well. So what I want to do is to say we can use experts in a different way. The way we use experts isn't very successful. And we can use experts for decision making, but particularly for bringing together the evidence, for collating the evidence. And there's a team here busy looking at uh, forests and reptiles to add to this knowledge. We want to have it so the evidence is sitting there and evaluated by experts. So if a practitioner or someone wants to use it, they can do that in minutes rather than now. If you want to do a review of the literature, it will take you months to do that. We want to f fundamentally change the way conservation works so you can do um, science to practice. It's a process that you can do over a cup of tea rather than as a, a, a month-long exercise. Finally, uh, where, uh, in Cambridge, we're just setting up the David Attenborough building. We've got 500 conservationists moving into this building. Please come along, please come and see us. And especially we've got a meeting, British Ecological Society and Cambridge Conservation Initiative on science and policy. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Come along and join us and we'd love to see you then. Thank you. <laughs>